we have two extremely bald men uh, talking today and one man who still has his hair. And so, uh, so Ronnie, by the end of this, we'll see if we can't convince you to, to shave it. On this episode, I'm really thrilled to welcome uh, a gentleman who I've known for some years and excited to, to chat with him about this, this Gen X stuff today, Dave French. Dave, how are you, man? Good, good. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, is, it is really cool to reconnect with you. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit about your ride, and, and we'll talk about some of the intersections of where we had a chance to work with you in the past along the way. But um, you know, I, I want to I want to start with you talking about your journey. Uh, you're now uh, in Memphis with uh, you know Memphis with the Memphis brand, and so I want to hear about that. But go back and start coming out of Villanova, and and tell us a little bit of your ride to to get Way to back. where you are today. Way back to the Wildcats. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I was uh, um, going into college and in college, like a huge music fan, like always have been, and also a little bit of like a, a technologist on the side, like kind of, you know, into that. And um, so when I graduated Nova, you know, I, I also knew I was in, I was in B school, I was in business school. Uh, there and I just could not stomach accounting uh like it was not my I just knew it, it was not my thing and marketing kind of felt like perfect and so I, I moved to New York got a gig at uh, a firm up there called Ruder Finn uh doing PR um and kind of slid into some really cool accounts uh primarily in the digital and music space and um and that was a blast because it was really like um you know, that was back in the day where you were still calling reporters and stuff, believe it or not, uh, to, to pitch stories. And so it was real trial by fire, um, but you learned a ton. And I was really excited because I got to work on things like um, uh, concepts like uh, Net for Music, which was like a nonprofit. Um, and then also Timesquare2000.com, which I was in Times Square for the, the change of the Millennial, so like that, uh, all of the those experiences kind of build up my resume enough to then, um, to then get on my next uh, journey, which was at MTV, uh, where uh, they were looking for a senior publicist at the time, and it was for MTVI, and if you guys remember, that was MTV.com, VH1.com, right, uh, right. Country.com. Uh, and I was way underqualified, uh, but I was like, just give me a shot, <laughs> just give me a shot. <laughs> and man, they made me do everything. I was, uh, I, I had to do like three interviews. They made me do like press writing, like a press release writing within like 15 minutes, like all this kind of stuff. I was like enough to get the gig. Uh, and so I was at MTV. It turned out, uh, it was the beginning of an eight year run at MTV, which was just, Kind of a a dream come true when you think about starting there around 2000 to 2008 uh was really like the heyday of trl yeah. punk and my ride um and and so you know it was, it was a great start of a experience that really started to teach me about the power of marketing and communications and media um and and how that intersects with pop culture and that that cultural zeitgeist that is not only American, but it's global. I mean, it's entire and, and the things that you can do to create that kind of um, cultural moment uh, was 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 an education you you can never pay for. Right. So. And, and then from MTV, that's where our paths start to intersect. Uh, it's probably around what? You were you were already at the National Park Foundation. Uh, you probably moved there what in 2013, 2014, somewhere around that time frame. Yeah, it was it was actually I moved to DC in 2008, uh, okay. and you know that was after you know I had the benefit of launching programs like Pimp My Ride right. and Punk and doing the Video Music Awards. But what I really loved coming out of MTV was all the pro social work that mm -hmm. they were doing, right? Um, which they don't get, and frankly, I think enough credit for, but 
programs like Choose or Lose, which was our youth voter activation campaigns, Fight for Your Rights, which was about um, domestic violence, Break the Addiction, which was about the environment. And I just, over the years, you know, having gone, you know, from MT, working at MTV in New York, LA, back to New York, leaving there as a vice president, um, I really wanted to do something in that cause related field. And quite frankly, I, I hunted around for quite a few months in DC. I didn't have a gig. Uh, I just moved to DC in hopes of finding something. Um, had a couple of interviews up on the Hill. Thank God I didn't get them. Uh, <laughs> and landed at the National Park Foundation, which at the time was pretty small. It was it was less than 20 people. We were in the middle of a leadership transition. Frankly, the organization was kind of upside down. And, you know, I had originally applied as a director of communications job. They they didn't give me that job. Uh, they gave it to somebody else, but they hired me still with this blanket title of executive. And I was kind of just given this opportunity to like shake things up. Like they're like, start throwing ideas around, you know, yeah. like what, what, what's going to work because we need to, um, quite frankly, there was a, a big concern about um, who national parks appeal to. Yeah. And, and, and really that being an older monolithic white generation. Right. And yeah. And that's not where America is going. And so how do we start to shake that up? And that was not only a concern of the foundation, but the National Park Service as well. And so coming from MTV, I, you know, had some experience, you know, with the millennial and Gen X generations and um, was able to start plowing road there, knowing that we had a big moment ahead of us in 2016, that being the centennial anniversary of the National Park. And uh, our paths crossed where we started and, and built a website and then became a, an agency partner. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny on the agency client side, um, whenever you start working with someone and, and you you try to figure out their path and where they come from, you know, a lot of times in the nonprofit space, they're coming from other nonprofits. But there's also many times where they're coming from the commercial side, uh, the, the the response from our end, whenever we learned that, wait a second, we're going to be working with a guy who came from NTV, like it kind of blew like, uh -oh. our hair that we had at the time back. <laughs> like, just, he has no just, idea what he's doing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what, what do you mean this guy coming from MTV and he's going to be in charge of fundraising? Right. Right. Like, right. But you were the was only a, one. And you mean, it was, it was really most in Washington, D.C. had that reaction to me. Yeah, they were true. like, we do not know what to do with this guy. He seems well-intentioned, but we have no idea what to do with this guy. But it, it, it was a it was a match, I think, that fits so well because of, like you said, your perspective on marketing and communications and messaging. And right. I mean, like, zone in on messaging and messaging that resonated uh, yeah. to help boost support. And so, yeah, we worked through the 2016 and then you, uh, you closed that chapter and, and now your new chapter in Memphis. Yeah. I mean, to your point, I think, um, national, national parks, I mean, what a, what a cool brand and uh, frankly movement, right. That we were able to uh, launch and invite a new generation, a new diverse young generation to be a part of. And, um, you know, that work, the Find Your Park uh, movement is alive and well. Uh, when you, you go to national parks everywhere, you still see it. And what a great gift. Like, I couldn't imagine that five years later removed. It's won Halo Awards and all these things. But more importantly, it's still out there. Like, it's yeah. still living and breathing and people are using it. And that's the best thing when you can launch something and it takes a life of its own. And, and yeah. you know, after... Parks, you you know, I got a call from the folks here in Memphis who had another, you know, it was kind of one Memphis again, iconic brand, but I thought a little bit kind of um, lost uh, and um, kind of living in its in in the wake of its past, and um, you know, they called and said, hey, we want someone to basically come in and be the chief marketing officer, but we have an idea of this being a nonprofit, right? This isn't going to be, you're not going to work at the city. You're not working at the chamber. You're not working at tourism. You're working with all those entities, but you're your own thing. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which I love because as a nonprofit, we could be quicker, faster, mm-hmm. uh, uh, chances that other entities couldn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really, you know, what's been exciting about the work here and launching this is not only Memphis is, I mean, already iconic, but there's so many untold stories here about young, diverse, black, Latino change makers doing world class uh, work and things, whether that's uh, what's happening at St. Jude, which is based here in Memphis, um, or um, addressing, you know, uh, as, as this country has this, you know, racial reckoning, really important conversations mm-hmm. about equality and inclusion and race with us being the home to the National Civil Rights Museum. Yeah. None of those stories were being told. We, we quite frankly, we're spending a lot of time still talking about Elvis, who I love, by the way. Um, but uh, that was a that was a killer opportunity. And I remember distinctly, there was a lot of people scratching their heads at National Parks being like, why, why is he going to Memphis? Right. I think now I can explain better. But uh, once you come here and you feel it and you see it and the power of the story that's yet to be told, you can't help but want to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, fascinating journey and you're still on it. And, you know, uh, I, we're thrilled to get to talk to you today about, uh, about Gen X and the study that we put in the market, which we've shared with you. Uh, when, when Ronnie and I were kind of thinking through who would be interesting and provide a unique perspective, you were one of the names that immediately came out. And and that's because, as you mentioned, you, you worked with three iconic brands that in different ways touch Gen X. So just talk a little bit about like your perspective on Gen X as a, as a marketing audience through the prism of your time at MTV parks and, uh, and, and now at Memphis. Yeah. And listen, I'll I'll throw a little bit back onto the study because I think it's really well done. And I think one of the, probably the key insights out of that is that it's not monolithic. This generation uh, the, you know, often referred to as for, the forgotten generation, right? Like kind of lumped in between boomers and millennials. You know, Gen Xers, you know, have also changed the world. But I think they're growing, them growing up in the advent of the internet, right? And the infancy of the internet and that technology coming to fold, um, literally in the matter of years, like, I went to college still at a time where you had to go to the library, right? Mm-hmm. To still like do your paper. And, but three years behind me, that had completely changed, you know? Right. And so um, when you got to like the media companies, like when I was at MTV, it was a really interesting time because here we have these mega brands, these mega cultural um, programs that have started to take shape, TRL, Right. Um, which you could make the case um, a little bit, perhaps the precursor to short form programming yeah. um, and, and music videos even. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then also um, shows like the Osbournes. And again, you know, you point to like um, punk, right? Like, you know, what we were doing was really taking content. Uh, and yeah, we were putting in a 22 minute formats, but it was short form. Mm-hmm. And that in many ways turned into the, the precursor of, of a lot of what you see um, starting to take shape. I think that it, it, the content is one small example, I think, of how technology has shaped this generation so dramatically in the ways that they give, in the ways that they identify with brands, in the ways that they see themselves. And I think they get overlooked a lot because m- millennials, quite frankly, are known as the tech generation. Yeah. That's, of course, until centennials or Gen Z really pop onto the scene right. full force, right? But right. Um, I think, you know, Gen X uh, right now, you know, probably you're looking at the 40-year-olds who have kids. They have tremendous spending power. They're, they're, they are giving to generation or they're giving to lots of nonprofits, but there's this really unique split that I think you guys identify between older Gen Xers and younger Gen Xers that are more familiar with technology that and, and less uh, familiar with technology. That is really uh, poignant. And that that played out that has played out in spades 
across all the brands I've worked on, you know, and even reflecting back on the MTV to kind of tie a knot, you know, as much as we did TRL and Pin My Ride, when I got the call from the Hollywood Reporter about, hey, there's this new thing out there, it's called YouTube. Do you want to, do you have a comment? MTV wasn't ready. Like, like, like we were not ready for that, to have yeah. that conversation. And that's where you see, I think, the fragmentation of media is starting to begin. So I, I can go down lots of roads, but hopefully it shows examples of how this generation in particular is so, um, has been so kind of um, adaptable, uh, if, if I can use that word. Been th through so many experiences with, I think, technology being a, a primary driver underneath it. Knowing that, you know, that divide that you see within Gen X is, is there something that you can take from that, that, that nonprofits can use in the way they address or speak to the, the audience? Like, you know, do, do you kind of diversify your message knowing who you're talking to with that split in the internet, you know, the rise of the internet? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, and, and again, as the study points out, technology really shapes giving patterns. I think once you get into this middle Gen X generation, right? Like I uh, fall into that younger Gen X category, as is my wife, although she's borderline millennial, I guess. Um, there's no way we're responding direct mail. Now, that doesn't mean that's ubiquitous, right? But we give online, we give and uh, through texting or, or uh, social media campaigns. And I think that has has is really turning the tide. Email, I think, immensely important. Um, obviously, the medium for boomers, direct mail is still king. But I think as you look down the road and you look at the adoption rates of technology of millennials and Gen Z, right? Gen Z, sorry, I call them centennials. Yeah, yeah Gen Z. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, 90%, 95%, 98% adoption rates. Like, I just think um, there's a huge yeah, evolution, let's call it, in giving. I will also say with technology comes, uh, I think, in part globalization. Like, mm -hmm. I think you are more globally conscious because we're all more connected. And so I think things like the environment, um, I think, and global warming, I think things like um, um, human rights causes that impact everybody um, become much more tangible to those generations that have been impacted so much by technology. Yeah. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, we'll see how it plays out, but those generations are also, are maybe not giving as much, but they're giving to more charities, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think it's incumbent upon nonprofits to understand that and understand the giving patterns, how these generations see the world. And I think you guys also do good work in the report to, to, to dive into personas and understand that you can't just deem uh, uh, people based on their age, right? Yeah. There's other characteristics inside of that that's really important to how you talk to them. Uh, right. And how uh, you you can see the world through their eyes, which is is core to any good marketing. I want to I want to touch on the personas, but before I do, uh, a comment that you made that that has been I don't know I've been just kind of marinating on it, and it is the the role of of male. Um, you'll recall, and and actually this study, um, McQueen Mackin Associates were who we partnered with for this study. You'll recall the great work that we did with Josh McQueen mm -hmm. that helped set up a lot of our pre-centennial messaging yeah. uh, with National Park Foundation back in the day. Josh and his team were, were fantastic. Uh, something that Josh said to me years ago was that channels, channels ultimately don't die, they evolve. And right. so I, I'm so curious, and I'm starting to see, I think, an evolution in in mail there's some organizations that uh that my wife and i support where where we receive gift catalogs that are magazine quality like great stock professional photography the typeface is is, is 
curated. And so those sorts of pieces, my wife, like she, it looks like she's looking at a magazine, right? And she, she responds to that sort of thing. Likewise, over the course of the last year with the now emergence of QR codes into Western marketing, Right. right. It's, been it's like they were here forever, and but then now, they weren't, and then they came back. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, but, but now you can't go to a restaurant and, and even not only a restaurant, but now I'm starting to see them worked in to TV, right? Hold us up mm -hmm. and scan this so that you can go to this website. Yeah. And, and so I think that, you know, you look at the, the presence of technology impacting direct yeah. mail. And I do yeah. think there are ways that it can be, it can be a driver the same way that display has been a driver for online forever. Mail is starting to become a driver for other forms of getting amongst a younger generation, I believe. Yeah. Again, I think it's knowing your audience and, and, but I think there's also um, variables that don't change or th that are relatively consistent. And what we're finding is rule of nine, which I talk a lot about with my team. And it's now nine impressions for someone to have recall right? To remember who you are, what your brand is. So you need to get in, some, in front of someone nine times. So you frankly need to play in, on all of these uh, if you can. And if you can, you have to prioritize wh you know, where you're going to see the best ROI. But um, that rule of nine is what leads to that, that brand affinity and brand loyalty. And so that's where you're not just getting the one gift, but then you're hopefully starting to talk about monthly giving, right? Yeah. And you're starting to talk about year over year and people staying on the roll as you guys have educated me. If you get someone on the roll for two years or more, like they're going to stay on for a lifetime. And then it has halos of plan giving and all, all sorts of things. But it's still rule of nine. It's still you have to get in some, in front of someone nine times. So I think direct mail can play a role um, yeah. from 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 that perspective um, uh, at, alongside social and digital right. and email and, and yeah. frankly, you know, it's funny. Memphis is home to more nonprofits than any other city uh, in the country. And it, we're, in fact, America's most generous city uh, deemed by the Chronicle of Philanthropy in the ways that Memphians give because we have so many nonprofits. Uh, and even the smallest one, you start to see them understand that, like, OK, we we have to play across the arena. So not to diminish at all the importance of direct mail. Of course, I, th I think yeah. you're dead on yeah. that. But sure. I think your point about evolution it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an evolving game. Um, but I think those impressions are always going to be really important. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, back to personas and we struggle with this at times, um, in, in various conversations, like the, the end benefit and use of, of persona. So it, I, Talk a little bit. We we do go into the study and we actually build out, as you said, personas amongst the millennial, the younger Gen X, the older Gen X, and and Boomer. But I'm just curious for you as a marketer and and give us some examples. What good are personas? How do you how do you actually turn those personas into a marketing strategy or layer them into your strategies and and how how can you use that? Sure. So. You know, I think first just backing up and explaining personas, you know, are kind of the uh, characteristics of an individual, right? It's it's a little bit us shaping, okay, well, uh, beyond their age, who is this person that we're trying to reach and actually putting some dimensions around that. And, you know, I think the first time we started to play with personas, um, much much less at MTV, but really at national parks to try to understand, okay, because we, yes, we have to understand the differences between generations, but um, just from a, a, a racial background, let's think about how people are experiencing national parks, right? Mm -hmm. The African-American community and the Latino community experience parks much differently than white people, right? Mm -hmm. um, Often, um, you know, I remember hearing, I was talking to the, the superintendent at Yosemite, who gets a huge influx of the Latino population. And, and one, not always comfortable with the outdoors. You know, they are not gonna go deep wood backpacking, like, mm -hmm. right? But uh, nothing's ubiquitous, right? None of this is always, always. 
But right. um, one of the things that the, the superintendent, uh, who was also a uh, Latino uh, uh, at the time, said, bro, bro, I was like, we can't, uh, the real, we learned we can't have our picnic tables so far apart. We need to make sure that they're together because these places are places of family reunions. They're about telling stories. It was their transformative experience of a park, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, here in Memphis, you will see sermons happening in our city parks, right? Uh, where it's literally a religious experience. We're going to have our sermon and outdoors in a park. So you need you need to have those understandings to effectively appeal and speak to, to have a relationship with. And that's really what we're talking about here, right? It's not just a one and done transactional thing. As a nonprofit, you're building relationships. It's relationship yeah. marketing. Uh, you need to have a deeper insight into who you're talking to. So personas have become really helpful for us to dive into specific categories of, of individuals inside perhaps a larger demographic um, to our generation, I should say, to speak to them in the language that they understand, mm -hmm. right? And that's not just the medium, it's the message. Mm -hmm. And so you don't speak to all millennials the same way. You're gonna speak to um, working, you know, working African-American moms that are single parents differently than you would with a kid who's just graduated college and wants to start his own business. And that's the work I'm in doing here in Memphis. And as we think about recruiting or retaining talent, how we help people find jobs, mm -hmm. how we start new businesses, um, and all the rules still apply from a nonprofit perspective. And, and I think it gets to the underlying point that I'll just get is research. Mm -hmm. um, I know it can be expensive at times, and it's really hard as a nonprofit to, to say we can justify it. But man, it can make a world of difference in going from OK to great. Uh, just to take the time to know your audience, to do the research, uh, and, and to also set the baseline. So I can't tell you the number of times I've gone into a, a conference room or a conversation and everybody's head perks up when you start to show them data, because all of a sudden it becomes real. And it's not just this imagining it. It's very easy with marketing uh, and even to the extent nonprofit fundraising by the way, I think there's an intrinsic relationship between marketing and fundraising that, you know, but everything becomes much more real when you start to show data, right? And people take you much more seriously. And so that is the un kind of an underlying discussion around personas is you become, you go from good to great and your work, uh, the return on your investment in that work, I think becomes much more tangible. So as you, um, as you think about the work that you're doing now in Memphis, and, and even more broadly, you, you self-identified as a younger Gen X. We appreciate that. Uh, so so uh, you should chiron on me. You should do lower third, David Friend. <laughs> younger so, younger so Gen X. <laughs> but when you, so I, I'm just curious, you know, as we kind of wrap our conversation, what do you see this emergence of Gen X looking like you mentioned the fact that that more often than not they're thought of as the forgotten generation mm -hmm. right they are and so uh, so right by under like it's true i mean it's it's a it's almost a fact <laughs> it is right so so there's so much focus on boomers so much anticipation and and you know excitement about millennials and the sheer size and buying power and and our study has all sorts of nuggets that it's not to disprove those things. It's just to point out that, no, there's this other group that's right in the middle. I'm just curious, like, what what do you do with that as a marketer now looking at recruitment of companies and looking at recruitment of people into, uh, into a very culturally diverse city? Uh, but even more broadly, as a Gen Xer, what do you, what do, you do with all of that? I mean, I think it, it would, it's... Um... Ir it's that's too strong maybe it would be irresponsible as a marketer just to fly by gen xers i mean gen xers quite frankly are are in their moment and they will be for the next the decade or so right uh or longer perhaps you're seeing the largest transfer of wealth from generational transfer of wealth from boomers to gen xers and then millennials so that is significant uh 
you know, interestingly enough, Memphis um, is the number one city where Gen Xers are buying homes. Uh, they're the number one demographic. <laughs> so uh, we are, you know, we are proudly affordable uh, and and you can have a huge impact. I think Gen Xers also are driven by cause. Um, they, def in fact, define, I think, themselves by the causes that they support. It's almost like how, and I would say millennials share that too, but um, very much like if you go around saying like, I mean, people are proud to say, hey, I support the World Wildlife Fund, right? Like, or I support the National Civil Rights Museum. It tells something about you, right? And I think Gen Xers are very uh, much of that mind. They're very cause driven. You know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, how Gen Xers play out versus boomers. I, I find that to be the most interesting to me in terms of as, as frankly, as boomers kind of age out, Gen Xers come in, what do those giving habits become? Do they stop giving to as many and start to narrow in on just a few that they're really right. passionate about? I'm not so sure. Like, I don't know the answer to that. You guys might, but I think it, you know, right now, whether you're in tourism, you're in economic development, you're in real estate or you're a nonprofit, um, Gen Xers in a lot of ways are driving. Uh, they're, dri they're starting new businesses. They're in a unique moment in their time where they're, they're, you know, they're, they're having enough affordable, you know, income where they can give. They also can have in many ways the lifestyle they want. So they have disposable income. Um, so I, I think right now it, it would be uh, erroneous to say you can just walk right past them. Um, I also think they're going to get credit in due time for being like a transition generation. I mean, to come up right in the middle of the advent of the internet and technology taking hold, I mean, that is a huge, I think, again, it goes back to why they're so adaptable and they're so hard to define, right? Because they're split down the middle by this huge shift in, in technology and, and technology is changing the world every single day. I mean, it is truly defining our world. And so uh, to me as a marketer, um, you know, I think they're hugely important. Um, obviously, you have to keep an eye on millennials and and centennials following them, Gen Z, because they are coming. But um, I think the influence Gen Z has is is paramount. I just don't think we do a great job talking about it. <laughs> like, I just don't <laughs> think there's a it's kind of a brand problem, right? Like they need a CMO. Say, hey, we're <laughs> they still here. They need a CMO. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's it's uh, but that's their, that's our nature. It's yeah. not really about us. Right? I don't right. think it. Whereas Gen Z or millennials, it's about social influence and having that power. And, you know, and boomers kind of had it thrust upon them just by being a huge generation. I think we've been more tepid and shy about it, but that doesn't mean we're not important. And marketers need to understand that. You know, it was something that that I, uh, I learned long ago. That I've talked about in relation to this study is that there is a generational pendulum, right? So if you go back to the silent generation, then the pendulum swings. And it's the reason why in many ways we become our parents, but in a lot of ways we try to go the opposite of our parents, right? Yeah. So that that pendulum swung from silent generation to boomers, and you have all of the social work that was done by the boomers in the 60s. All, I mean, I mean, my goodness, you're you're surrounded by it in the city of Memphis, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, so Huge. there's all of the civil rights work and the social movements that took place in the '60s, led by the Boomers. Then mm -hmm. they kind of settle in, and the pendulum swings back the other way. And you could look at like Alex P. Keaton as a great example of Gen X because he's got hippie parents, but he's a Reagan conservative, and and so it's more yeah. about other things and, and not as much about that big social and now you've got it swinging back i think and with millennials and so it really is interesting the um the impact that gen x can and will and is emerging to have as you said earlier as they're coming into their moment right yeah yeah and that's is so much of of marketing is moment right it's it's hitting at that right time and 
it's, you know, what's with, through this whole conversation, we've talked about being at that moment at MTV or at national parks and now here at Memphis, but, um, you know, I think, uh, Gen X is, it, it will continue to be incredibly important, but I think the, the analogy of pendulum is accurate and is, is right. I, the more I think about it, you know, the, we may not be like out there waving big flags, you know, all the time, but it doesn't mean we're not passionate about right. what's happening. Right. And so that makes them a really right target for causes and nonprofits, because um, I do think there's a huge passion inside uh, uh, the Gen X population to want to be part of positive change. Uh, and I think in many ways, um, powered by the, the legacy of the boomers, but even more so the, the, the outright advocacy in the streets we see now, the passion on display from millennials and others, um, that is um, undeniable. And, mm -hmm. and you can't help but um, whatever side you're on, I guess, uh, be part of, of that in some way, yeah. shape, or form. And uh, it, it is a moment of change in America. There's no doubt about it. And I think um, every generation is finding their way to play a role, play a yeah. part. So, um, David, if someone from, you know, our listeners wants to, to connect with you and, and talk more about uh, Memphis or talk about your experience, what are the best ways for them to, to connect with you? Sure. Uh, you certainly can find me on LinkedIn uh, and just search David French and Memphis brand or MTV or national parks or any of that. They can contact you guys, I guess. <laughs> um, um, but I would say, you know, more than anything, I will give a shout out just to check out wearememphis.com. Uh, you know, I think it might surprise you. Uh, this city has is so much going on and I'm just so proud to kind of being the guy that gets to stand behind the scenes, but help showcase these stories of the young people that are creating change here every day and let them take the spotlight, but frankly, give voice to the voiceless and, and shine a spotlight on them. And, uh, and if you haven't been to Memphis, come see us. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing, wonderful city uh, on the Mississippi that uh, is really coming into its own. And uh, I think um, when you get to, um, meet the people here, whether they work at St. Jude or it's the 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 guys who run the four way in Soulsville, which is, by the way, the best food you ever have in, in your life. Um, it, it it will change you. There's a soul here to this city that um, that uh, makes you a better person and makes you see the world differently. So. Check out wearememphis.com and I would love to talk to anybody. Uh, just hit me up on, on LinkedIn and uh, appreciate you guys having me today. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, Dave, we appreciate it. Uh, appreciate having you on the show and, and hearing your thoughts, man. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see what happens uh, in this next chapter and what happens with the city. Thanks, guys.